Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to Higher Podcast. Uh, today's topic is contentment. Uh, we're going to be talking about it from a philosophical standpoint to help uh, all of us critically think around things that we experience as humans. And I'm going to start that out by reading uh, a very popular quote from Pascal. Uh, I've only taken an excerpt from that quote, but we'll leave that link at the bottom of the uh, of the podcast links uh, on YouTube and all platforms. Uh, so his quote reads, All men seek happiness. This is without exception. Whatever different means they employ, they all tend to this end. This is the motive of every action, of every man or woman, uh, even of those who hang themselves. And yet, after such a great number of years... No one without faith has reached the point to which all continually look. All complain, princes and subjects, noblemen and commoners, old and young, strong and weak, learned and ignorant, healthy and sick, of all countries, of all times, all ages, and all conditions. He's kind of pointing out the cyclical type of behavior that manifests due to, due to that uh, search for contentment where, you know, you're looking for motives and the, those motivations are bringing you towards sources which may fulfill your contentment. And then you reach a different level of contentment. And then you're motivated to find different sources for various other reasons. Yeah, the plateaus that we talk, we've talked about before. Once you get something, and that comes in many different areas that we'll explore today. I love how exhaustive he was on how saying all people of all times, of all ages, of all strengths, of all learnedness, of all everything are on this same thing. And actually, I, I never read that part of the quote that he said at the beginning where he says, this is the motive of every action of every man, even those who hang themselves. Because I guess technically that's even what people go down that road or looking for is that peace and that happiness or that or, or to, to stop some struggle in some way um, or a, a level of discontentment. Yeah. I mean, you know, you think of some of the saddest states uh you know a man could be in or or person rather and um you know some of those lowest states where suicide is the result um is a you could say that's a lack of contentment certainly that's fair and what we're gonna add into this conversation i think because this conversation we're having today is about contentment is about limits as you, as you originally suggested limits and like i think because you can have Limits is to deal with excess, right? Sure. But yeah. the opposite of that is the things that you would be deprived of, whether it's shelter, love, whatever else, or many other different things. Rock bottom is that often you would, Yeah, the opposite. So we should talk about that limit. a little bit today. So I guess a, like, a question for me is like, it, it's very easy to see like, what is your what is your lowest limit? Like, you know, what won't you do? That type of thing. Like how low, how low can, can man get? So what, what I think is more interesting is like, what is the limits of contentment? What is the limits of happiness? Where is the limits of satisfaction? Oh, and, that's an interesting idea. What is the limits of contentment and happiness? There's a really interesting documentary that I highly recommend anybody watch. It's a BBC documentary called Dangerous Knowledge. It's on the mathematical concept of infinity. And because they end up getting into the conversation of math and in infinity, they end up getting in the conversation of God. It's not really about that. It's more about the math, uh, but they end up having some pretty interesting conversations about it. All four of the guys that studied the concept of infinity is went crazy, mm. and they kept thinking that they solved the equation, only to realize that they hadn't, then that they thought that they had, only to realize that they hadn't, back and forth until they went bonkers. Mm and went to the loony bin, the people that have most infamously studied it. The reason I'm talking about that is because it makes you wonder, since there's this really interesting concept of infinity, is something like happiness limited? And you would think, when I'm thinking about it now, and, and you know, I don't really like to get into like, like many uh, you know, sexual nuances of like every time kind of topic, but like when I think of like unlimited bliss of type of thing it's like this your whole it's like this i don't want to use the word orgasm but like i've heard uh a, a sneeze referred to as like a facial orgasm before okay 
I don't okay. know why this girl it's on my volleyball team talked, talked about it. But vocabulary. Yeah. She said she loved sneezing. I, I don't. Yeah, feel I think like, she's I alluding know. to. I, I think your uh, metaphor. But like, yeah. what is this? What do we? What is the highest level of happiness feel like? Is it? Is it just like? Is it? Because is there a physical sensation to it? Is there just a, a an emotional or mental state or this spiritual that's attached to a soul? If there is one, I think Pascal is trying to address this. And I hope this is my understanding, and, and I'm not saying that this is a correct um, interpretation of what we read earlier. But um, I think, you know, the, I, the so the concept that an infinite exists, and then we exist within a realm where there is something that is infinite, whether you call that God or the universe or what have you, right? But what what's interesting? Yeah, I, I think, think that's the term that I like to use more standardly is just infinite. Yes. And so, you know, if it's a commonly held that, you know, based on, I guess, Christian theology at the time, 1600s, so 17th century, when Pascal was writing, to consider God to be an infinite, eternal, divine force, um, and us existing, coinciding with this infinity, I think what he's talking about with contentment is when he talks about that bottomless void, it's sort of like our, you know, if we if we're organisms of this product of an infinite source, then we have to have some capacity to comprehend that infinity. I think he's kind of saying that contentment Which is damn near is, impossible to do like Jesus. That's right. That's right. That's so, why these guys are going, going crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And that's, that's just it. So if like the, you know, there's limits to human potential in certain extents. Right. But I think what he's trying to say with contentment is like, you'll never be a hundred percent content. Yeah, and you know what's interesting about that is that's proven in the current Canadian consumer debt crisis. The average person spending 172% of their income, $1.72 for every dollar that's earned, meaning, and I've, and I've been it, I was making forty five, fifty thousand 50000 in Halifax, I moved up to Toronto and got up to almost triple that, and I had the same amount of money in my account because I was just spending on more shit, mm. and I, I was just like always just accumulating more stuff and it feels like if i look back psychologically like i was waiting to get this perfect amount of things that satisfies every need i could possibly have mm -hmm. you know what i mean and now unfortunately it's just, it's i think the answer for pascal is to uh you know fill that void with god like meet the infinite with the infinite like you have a bottomless pit we'll put something infinite in it well that's why it's cool when you watch some things that you can see on documentaries or youtube where there's that where people live in very impoverished places and they're living a very like basic simple life but they have a, a great you know they have aunts and uncles all around it's a family gathering every dinner mm -hmm. they're all making the food like from scratch and it may just be something very modest but like it, they make it into something beautiful and people living a very simple good way of life that where they're just loving and and have, having little ways of creativity there's a lot of great great beautiful things in simplicity that's right yeah and i think what scares people at large or a population at large is that um simplicity negates growth and grow if you don't have growth you don't have progress and, and you know people are always trying to better themselves like people are always well it is a complicated balance trying to improve and it, which makes sense because there's a lot of things that are going on a lot of practices that we engage in that are not the best way to do things or they're not or, or they're actually inflicting damage or causing more harm than good and because okay, of let's talk about something like that and specifically in regards to that for a second mm-hmm it's not always the best way. So I believe I always want to do things the most intelligent way. I don't care about my preference. I don't care about what makes me cozy. I want to do things the best way. However, sometimes, and not I don't think everything is subjective. Some things are obviously objective. But sometimes our perception of the best way can be skewed. For example, um, let's think of something like, uh, I have no idea if this is accurate, but I'm just going to use what could be an example. Okay. Say that there's like a... Uh, a tractor. This is a terrible example. So everybody's gonna be like, "Go with what uh, you know." It's just a bad don't example. Be talking about tractors that have never like, been on a farm. I've been on farms, but this wouldn't actually apply because the tractor would actually do a better job. Nice. But something where something's automated in okay. a way. Sure. But if the and it seems like it's easier and it's more efficient, but an old man would tell you, and he's not just being one of these stubborn old, you know, whatever. Yeah. 
he's just saying this is the better way to do it by hand. Sure, it's, look it's at mass drastically produced. better quality. Look at mass produced clothing. When something's handmade and is of designer quality, and obviously you're paying for that quality, it's it's usually um, put together far better than something that's been stitched together on an assembly line, pumped out for a dollar twenty five. Yeah, the and that could carry over to anything. It could carry sure. over to. I'm just, just thinking of something that's automated. Soil, yeah, anything, yeah, yeah anything mm-hmm. like that. Yeah. So uh, no, I hear you. I mean, like some of the best cars in the world are handmade. You know what I mean? That they're not assembly line cars. When you start spending a million dollars and shit like that, right? It's put together by a team of guys that know what they're doing. And it's like goes back to that thing that I shared with you that was in that documentary in Netflix. I forget what it was called. The Jim Carrey's producer guy. Oh yeah. Um, where he's interviews a guy and he's talking about how the misconception of if we're naked and cold in the woods as any Neanderthal would be at the beginning of like some basic kind of human existence. If we're just given shelter and like some clothes and some warm Mm -hmm. drink and and food, we're now very happy. Mm -hmm. Happy is a big and shit. Yep. Your objectives shift. Now you can move on. But then the misconception is the more stuff I now have, the happier I will become. And that goes right into postmodernism. Well, you know what? You kind of touched on that too when you're talking about, uh, you know, your income uh, differentiation and your spending habits and things like that because it is the thing. Like when you you have more shit, you have more responsibilities. And in terms of money, it's like, you know, the more um, that you're trying to balance, I guess, at once, the more you're spreading out your reach, the more it costs to maintain that lifestyle or whatever it is. Oh, yeah. And that shit is crazy. But that's very similar, right? Like you can attain even wealth, right, to a to a successful extent where that doesn't not only breed contentment, but it also doesn't um, make your uh, it doesn't make you richer, I guess, to make more money, right? It, it costs more to be to make more money. So I'm gonna take us on. I'm gonna go pause. So pause. Pause is when we want to just briefly interject. Could be a little bit of a tangent, but it's an interesting little something related to what the person just said so you said uh lifestyle yeah. maintaining a certain lifestyle yeah does it and i don't have an opinion on this for the record we're exploring it does it make sense when somebody gets divorced that they should pay enough that that person continues to support the lifestyle that they lived so if they lived a very lavish lifestyle you have to continue to pay them to live lavish because that's what they deserve for having had time so... with you i don't know Sounds weird. This is a, in my opinion, this is a super conditional. And I came from a divorce family. I don't know if you came super from a situational family. in each case. You mean? Yeah. Well, so so sense. my approach to that would be situational in the sense that some people give up aspects or or the entirety of their lifestyles um, to facilitate the the lives of their successful partner. In those ones, I totally agree. And and, and that if that's the case with them, yeah, then that makes all the sense. If the world, you spend they should 10... be getting at least that, if not more for what's going on. Well, well especially if you can well, okay. So hold on. Hold. Okay. Okay. I'm, okay. I'm doing that thing. I said earlier, I, I know you're opinion, skipping over yourself. And I'm like, wait a second. Yeah. That only matters to me as much. No, sorry. Okay. That's, I'm saying that totally wrong. I'm start Cause that's not my opinion either. It's more impactful with kids. Is it not? Because if you're just somebody that's at home, then what have you what have you given it up for? You just chilling? What did you give it up for? Are you doing a really awesome job at taking care of me while I do that? That's right. Or are you just living the life? That's right. Because if you're just living the life, and I've had like other people to do all that shit for me, mm-hmm. then fucking I'm not stopping you. Go sure. do whatever you want to do. That's right. If you're, I shouldn't ha- have to sign a prenup, and maybe that's the case, to say. Well, I guess at, at the end of the that day, that's just, legal case, work. Right? that's just legal work. So I guess so, at the end of the day, you can't trust human words in general, not men more, women less or more. Now, if if your partner chooses to sign a prenuptial agreement, I would think that would, you know, obviously show that they're more trustworthy than not. And that, um, you know, you would you would so have too. a mutual verbal so agreement. They, you, could, you could argue with them the same reason they're arguing that they don't want to sign. You don't trust me? Or what? You don't trust me? That's right. Yeah, and it's and that's the thing too. Um, obviously, m- making a certain amount of money and being successful to a certain extent requires, uh, you know, you to protect yourself in various ways. Would you get um, a prenup? I don't. I wouldn't get married. So get I, married. I wouldn't even get to that step because 
to, to have a contractual partnership with somebody, it's like, you know, I'd be nervous enough about going so into business with someone. you're just doing like a common law type of thing for life, which actually is interesting. Like, you could totally do that. Oh, yeah. Because no. they treat you, actually. You know what? They treat you. Oh, you know what? No, you're fucked still. Because they treat you in the same way, bro. Yeah, if you the choose banks will to, treat you the same way. As soon you, as you live with somebody over a year, yeah, everybody treats you as if you're married. For sure, as, as if, if somebody. So it don't matter if you don't it. get married. Yeah. But, so you're. What are you gonna do? Every time you're with somebody for eleven year, eleven months and twenty nine days, you're gonna be like, No, I'm gonna be like this person about these contract life. <laughs> I'm gonna tell them that this person's my roommate. When I file my taxes, I'm an individual mm, citizen. Don't say that on radio. <laughs> I've been filing my taxes for years, man. They don't. They don't need to know nothing. It's Canada. They would have We're to do right. a hell of an investigation on your Facebook. As, so don't be putting in this. I'm in a relationship with Facebook. Then no, nobody needs to know that. No. And relationship is highly subjective anywhere, so never stand up in court. Even if that's they, right. Even man, if CRA plays saying. this for the yeah. police. I used to hang out with my buddy way more than I'd hang out with my girlfriend. I don't know what that says, but that's the truth. It means you've got good, healthy relationships. Just that whole you have to maintain somebody's lifestyle I find interesting. But definitely. Yeah. Well, that's not disrespect to all of the obvious situations. Because then, anytime people listen to opinions, they want to like quickly demonize and assume some generalization. I'm just thinking there's so, it's what you said. There's so many different kinds of situations mm -hmm. that like. That's why we have judges, and that's like why we how have do you courts. have even like general overlying rules? I don't know. Well, you have standards well, that are set have to. by. That's a you have you have legal precedents set by other situations. You'll, more often than not, you'll stumble across yes, a situation but I, that but I guess something The reason else. I'm saying is because it doesn't seem like it always necessarily ends up being mad fair. Because I well, think that people that are wealthy mm -hmm. or that make a certain amount of money where they're like, they're taken care of in a way that that person's not doing a lot at home and they could just be going and you're not restricted. Like going to, I guess it's, it's even based very much on that. Sure. Yeah. But that should all be, geez, what? Relationships are so difficult, and that's all the bullshit we got to deal with before we even get into the legal and contractual stuff. That's what I'm saying. Do just not to, just a getting along, right? You would have Crazy. to be the smartest motherfucker in the world, and so confident in your relationship to sign a legal agreement with another individual like that. I, I see that, dude. You would have to have some fucking balls. I'm just saying. A lot of people get married. I don't think they really think about here's the thing what they're doing. Here's the thing. I could see having that level of confidence in somebody because I okay. discovered that. I didn't think it was possible, but I did, dis I did discover that it was possible to, to have that level of trust. However, mm. um, that's only in somebody's current state. So as we've discussed mm -hmm. before, would you ever kill someone? Would you ever get a DUI? Would you ever something extreme? And everybody yeah. wants to say immediately no, but nobody has a fucking clue what they can become. Right. Unless you're in a situation. So you, if you get abducted by ISIS and they put you in a room where you're getting indoctrinated with all this weird shit like there's you never have any idea what you can become if you're not attentive to your character mm -hmm. that's the punchline so how does contentment work with that so you know like how much how much does like self-awareness and intention and kind of just like willpower come into contentment because you touched on poverty earlier and poverty is like what you were describing with the maslov's uh hierarchy of needs where you take care of these base needs shelter food income you know um enough resources to satisfy your base needs um a lot of people living in conditions of poverty often don't fulfill those needs yet so you like you pointed out like they can have these levels of contentment that to the outsider seems misplaced and i'm just like curious like, where it's just like you know how much even for pascal like how much is faith in god just a a practice of willpower right and and that fulfillment of just simply like feeling that you know affects your outlooks and affects your contentment because ultimately contentment is just leading to your motivations right like what what's gonna push you like i'm not happy about my physicality so i join kung fu you know i'm not happy about you know some of my batter habits so we've tried you know taking uh you know some chunks of time okay and... well then this is maybe the perfect time i was gonna hold off on it uh, but this might be the perfect time to read this quote because you're saying too many things that relate to it it's a quote by manly p hall i'm gonna it's maybe paraphrased i don't know 
um, but I think I remember it pretty well. And it says, if you do not lead the mind, it will lead you. And it can only lead you in regards to what it knows and has experienced. Mm. And this, for me, you have to make everything about what you do and think and speak at all times. And certainly I am far from a victor in those areas. Um, okay. You have to be very attentive to those things because you can only be led on, if you've only had, and that's what creates bad people is that cyclical, that's all they know. Mm -hmm. You have to be so intentional about getting out of what you know, being able to have those conversations. And I'll quickly touch on the fact that anytime we've mentioned, and which has happened two or three times now in the conversation, anything on this podcast about God, all I can think about is all the people that would listen, that would struggle deep inside because they're atheist or they have a whatever feelings about whatever. Having a conversation about this infinite character, it's in philosophy all over. You cannot avoid it. It doesn't mean we're trying to sell religion or anything else, but people shouldn't have like that block, that psychological block where as soon as they I, hear that, it's such a deep struggle for people and they, you have to be able to talk about it. Even if you don't like it, it has to be in the conversation in different kinds of ways. Yeah. Everything has to be in the conversation. No, I totally agree. And I'd really like to point out just quickly, like how liberating it can feel. Like I'm, I'm not a religious person. I'm not schooled in theology by any means, nor did I grow up in a religious household. I'm just, I, I would just think that like, it is such a liberating feeling to um, talk about God and to address that. I think it's a liberating it's, feeling to talk about all of the things that are the biggest hardest most interesting all of those things that are the biggest to talk about oh for sure everybody Every has an topic. opinion about those things tough topics everybody has an opinion about religion everybody has an opinion about money uh but you know that doesn't come up all the time like your your common conversation doesn't have somebody making a statement about like what the impact of belief in god might have on them and things like that right it's interesting Okay, so where we're going to bring this now, because it's limits, and this is an interesting topic we've gotten into, and then we'll take it into oh, postmodernism after that. I Go bring ahead. up something really quick, because you were talking me, about... Wait, uh, let me write this down before I forget, though. Um, is limits... Combo. Okay, go ahead. So the the quote you just read, uh, what was the gentleman's name? Manly P. Hall. Manly if you don't P. Lead Hall. Your mind, it can only lead you in what you already know. Right. And so what the brain already knows is a combination of both conscious and unconscious inputs. Right. Um, there's a writer, William S. Burroughs. For anybody who wants to look up, he did some Harvard lectures back in the 70s, and they're they're really great. It's about creative writing, the creative writing process. He's a prolific writer in and of himself, and uh, he created the Beat Poet. Uh, movement and, and that kind of thing back in the 50s. Um, so his theory on creativity is a good writer is always receptive in the sense of your sensual sensual input. So keeping your eyes open. A good writer... Sensual? Yeah, in terms of your sensory. senses. Sensory. sensory. Sensory, not sensual. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'm feeling sensual. He's talking about sensory. Sensory. Fuck. Sensory. Sensory. And so, you know, he says things like, a good writer never looks at his feet. You're always looking up and around. Even if you're not consciously thinking about writing or thinking about being creative, your eyes are absorbing information. You're seeing a building with texture that, That's you know, why if it's later... it's so different when you see a music video instead of just listening sure. to music. Like, it's it's drastically different. Yeah. And and the more stimulus your brain observes, the the more complex your connections to information become. So, you know, for kids they start with blocks and shapes, but eventually kids like looking at letters. Even if they can't read, they'll they'll look at text because it's a very it's complex more, more organization. Yeah. Cool. Super stimulating. I didn't know that. Yeah, it's it's complex symbol, symbols um ordered in a in a, you know, a fashion and a metric and everything and so they can uh it's very stimulating. I wonder if we're supposed to to graduate up through our older year or through our years looking at different levels of complexity because there's some amazing amazing different kinds of complex geometric shapes these what are those things called the, nowadays those fractals the, well there's those two well the fractals then yeah, there's the course. things that everybody like mandela or some crap like that people are oh mandalas them yeah that, that, that's mm -hmm. like some... hey it's interesting because it yep. says what you were saying it's more complex shape and the kids like it. Well, mm -hmm. we're adults now and people are coloring yes. these things. So. Right. And well, that, okay. Yeah. 
I don't want to talk about the whole coloring book phase <laughs> fad. That's like this whole, it's really this like really it. sad like way it. to commodify mental health insecurities without actually educating people on mental health uh, at all. So it's like color this book. I'm like, it's a stress book. It's a depression I coloring thought you book. Necessarily it's like you just initially said something there. No, no, no. But then that was very, very no. Yeah, I could buy there, there's some problems exactly. with that because like people have, are that's people are what so. I have a problem with, and I'm not going to name any names. A lot of these gurus out here mm -hmm. to be talking all this repackaged stuff, and they're not really right. helping people understand, and they're just giving them this temporary chicken soup for the soul. Yeah, and it doesn't last. If you've got money to publish thousands of copies of a fucking coloring book take all that money and put it into the healthcare system i don't want your fucking book i want better more accessible access for reasonable resources well they can have those books right in the healthcare center but it, <laughs> but, it <can't, laughs> yeah. but that's not what they're yeah. doing right they're no, just making they're not solving they're just the problem marking it up by a hundred times they're making money off <laughs> the problem making mad money so say it's like too expensive or it's not and convenient then, for you to see a psychologist and you're like well fuck man i'm really depressed it's really almost anxious. like dealing i'm gonna buy that book because it's like a placebo because i've only yep. just given you something yep and maybe there is some really cool stuff in there sure but all you're gonna know is about coloring it right that's right doesn't really give you any skill either well, to end my point here, not to give any dead air away or whatever. Um, so William S. Burroughs, so he, he has, he's advocating for this like constant unconscious input of stimulus. Um, and that will help you later critically to pull up details and connections that you didn't consciously make. Your brain's doing that for you. So part of this thing about leading your brain is like you want to make sure to expose your brain to as much as possible. If it does lead you in moments where you're not in control, it's got to be the most well-informed leader it can be. If you want to take it in that way, right, as a separate agent. Oh, I like the way you put that. So, you know, the the best we can hope for is to remain educated, to remain critical, to ask good questions, so that in those moments where we're not thinking, we are we're making better, more quality connections than we would if we were uninformed, uneducated. Maybe that sounds a little pompous, but I mean, like, no, read, it's good. read a book. It's, good. it's just right? I'm starting to question the term educated. And right. informed because you, because like I, I talked to you the other night, you can be educated and informed on some dark, weird shit. That's For sure, not like you healthy, can not healthy to to regularly exercise oh. in your mind. People talk about that all the time. They go to prison, say you got picked up on like some menial uh, criminal charge or what have you. You come out of there with a bunch of knowledge, bunch of knowledge, you know, that maybe you otherwise would not want to have or have had exposure to, but you are now educated to be a better criminal. You know, if that happens in circumstances, obviously there's variations. But. Yeah, well, I guess that'll be the top for another day. So take us into post-materialism. Yeah, right. So, yeah, we were talking about poverty, and I was kind of on and off that a little bit. Materialism is generally just, um, you know, your concerns after your base needs are met. But uh, here's a Britannica definition of post-materialism. It's a value orientation that emphasizes self-expression and quality of life over economic and physical security. Um, it was coined by the American social scientist uh, Ronald Englehart. Uh, Read that for me again. Very smart guy. So yeah, again, post-materialism, the value orientation that emphasizes self-expression and quality of life over economic and physical security. Now, now the to reason us a little bit in simpler terms. Right. So yeah. So the reason why uh, our value orientation is different from so our your value base orientation, needs, meaning what our perception of value. Right. Yep. Okay. So, so what you're, Perception what you work what towards. Valuable. Yeah. What you okay. work towards. Right. So, so the idea is here that like that shifts because your base needs are met because your physical security and economic security is met. Um, so what they're oh. saying here is that what is emphasized is self-expression and quality of life. Now those are very subjective, right? And we're seeing like a lot of these issues come up in types of like policy concerns with um, gender neutrality, um, types of sexualized policies that um, post materialism having to do with those things. Yeah, so post materialism so? is is like so. Okay, think about it. It's just like you have you have a country that's so successful and such a high GDP that one of their greatest social strifes is like who can use what bathroom. Now you have another country Ooh. that has like 0% GDP and they're living a tribal fucking lifestyle. You think they give a fuck who's like using what bad, like, so these concerns are not met. It de depends on where you that's are, right? Interesting. That's very so interesting. that's your value orientations. Now this is heavily based off of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And so that's a good visual representation um, to show you like, you know, where the base of your triangle 
is your uh, food insecurity and your housing and everything. And you can't build that pyramid unless you have that foundation. And so that's a nice, simple visual way to see this. Uh, what Engelhart does is he he takes Maslow's structure and he kind of adds to it. And he he does talk about um, more of that self, uh, self-expression and quality of life. And he fits that in there nicely. Um, so, you know... It's it's just interesting with contentment. Like, you know, you think you would be happy with just a nice place to live, lots of food, plenty of resources, clean air, clean water, good environment. Um, but that's not true, right? Like, you can win the life lottery, be born in Canada, middle class family, whatever, good friends, good community, low crime rates, stuff like that, and you can be fucking miserable. And I feel like you know? even a lot of things we're talking about right now can sound, if we're saying them way controversial, we are always open to any topic, any feedback from anybody listens as an audience. If you've got a topic or you got an opinion, you want to come on the show, you want us to address something that we've said, you want us to talk about something as a primary topic of the show, we're always happy to talk about it. We're always uh, happy to clarify and be very clear so that people don't misconstrue or skew surface levels, opinions or statements and always open to clarifying those things. And so I think it's also important to point out, too, that post-materialism manifests not only in democratic countries, but countries that tend to be more um, individualistic as opposed to collectivist in the sense where break that down for me. Uh, commonly, I can't write and talk. Break, break down that, oh, what, what do you oh, mean break between it. those I two said things? Write that down. No, no, break down those two things and talk. Right. And explain, so, explain for me what you meant between individual versus collectivism is li- right. living more as a village type of or village raised child type of shit you mean this is about social social uh, ideology essentially so you can have a well-developed country you can take china right as a collectivist country and it's not just because they're, they have a communist regime it's it's the mentality of the the society and uh japan's probably a better example where there's a lot more uh community assistance and in, in the sense that everybody upholds certain standards and responsibilities not for themselves but for their neighbors and so that kind of takes a blanket effect of there is a proper way to to be as a citizen. There's a proper amount of, of respect and responsibility and things like that involved. And uh, it's those who participate are viewed as good citizens. And uh, so that's collectivist. Individualist is uh, the American dream, right? Come here, make as much money as you want, cut throats, do your best, be a baller, fucking fuck bitches, drive cars. Yeah. yeah, man, competition. Everybody's up for themselves as a sole survivor type thing. It's so crazy how our culture, yeah. even in like, um, like, like younger in urban culture, it's now like a cool thing to say that I fucked your bitch. Right. That's a very popular thing to brag. There's about an opening long like, line of like a song on Instagram. It's like I swear to God, every four or five videos, I gotta see somebody saying that about something. It's like, why are we saying sure. this? Like, what's going on here? And you know what? I don't know if that reflects and, poorly and on. I'm like, gross. Like, right? No, that's what I was gonna say. Sex with everybody. Yeah. Is that what's happening? Right. Like, settle down. Like. Yeah, no, it reflects badly on all parties. The average I believe. person in the downtown core of Toronto, told to me by a doctor in Toronto, unnamed, um, who's also in the downtown core, is one in seven for an STD. Ooh, I believe it. Sure, which includes, uh, of course, like temp- like things are maybe non permanent afflictions. There's well, certain obvious. Still, things. yeah, I don't care no. if it's not oh, yeah. permanent. Oh no, I understand. I'm just saying, you know, easy. somebody has crabs that counts as an STD, it's whereas it's not on the same level as fucking chlamydia, or you know what Jeepers. I mean? Yeah. But no, I hear you. That's a big, dirty, dirty old city. Well, I just think it's a state of people these days. I don't even think it's about the city yet, even like. But I guess both probably downtown there would be a little more hardcore. I would take like a larger population here. over a smaller one. Like Halifax is a high STD rate, and we're actually having an increased HIV rate. And that's largely due to intravenous drugs rather than unprotected sex. But I mean, of course, it's all relative and uh, balls. connected. I'm never having sex again as long as I live. But you know what I'm saying? So a smaller population, like less than 500,000 people, that shit can spread around pretty fast, right? But then you take a city like Toronto over a million people. And, uh, you know, shit happens. But I'd rather take the bigger population over the smaller any day. I'm going to go for zero. Hmm. You're going to be celibate. I'm so going to be you celibate. You will be a real Shaolin monk. Food. I'm just going to eat food. You can fuck food, too. I'm not going to. I'm just going <laughs> to eat you, it. If you're so compelled. And then I'm going to feel the same way in my brain as I would have in sex. So apparently there's a state. No, wait, this doesn't sound right. I think It'll it's Arkansas. Arkansas or Georgia. 
in in the United States, um, they have they have real policy. There's there's legislation against bestiality in that state. It's legal to fuck animals. Well, we're gonna Anything have a podcast else, about that. Not a person. We'll keep cruising However, for that. it is not illegal to fuck a vegetable. It's not illegal to fuck a vegetable. Correct. So, so now, any after, inanimate object, you mean? Oh, maybe that's where they're coming from. What sure, about a car? sure, right. Gotta yeah, be, it's got to be everything in that. There's a case somebody married their truck. Somebody married a roller coaster. I shit you not. These are real. I believe that. Somebody married a ghost. Wait, now you shouldn't be allowed to marry something that's not a thing. Well, if it's not your property, how are you I marrying a cares roller what coaster? People, what people want to do if they want to marry. Go ahead. I don't care. I don't know. I mean, how do you file taxes though? Right. We'll that's what I'm saying. This don't is get be a married. Whole conversation. Don't get married. You know what? And that's what we'll do sometimes. Is once in a while, if we go on a good tangent, we'll yep. just write that down as a another another topic another topic another day so for now we're getting back in the postmodernism <clears throat> or post materialism post materialism postmodernism was much earlier um you know and that's sort of like that's sort of like turn of the industrial revolution and i, I don't want to get off topic here too much but it, it is kind of related in the sense that these are both political theories um or sociological lenses and postmodernism uh, is also this like really intriguing thing in terms of contentment because World War One is called the Great War because nobody thought, even in the years following the war, that the world was a ever going to be the same, and nobody thought that the world was ever going to be back to normal. That was a war that either killed... one of those. I don't feel like they should use the word great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, like, the, so many people died, and there's so much physical uh, and peripheral uh, devastation. The spillover from the conflict um, probably affects, well, it it most certainly affects politics today. Most certainly. Oh, there's, yeah, of countries it's only exist effects. because of that. Well, no, countries only exist because of that. There's That was a huge clusterfuck. is a huge power grab, and the victors re wrote the history. Um, but so postmodernism comes out of that, where... All of a sudden, you have this heavily industrialized world. It's been completely changed. A huge amount of the population has been decimated. Cities are rebuilding. Countries are rebranding. Borders are being redrawn. And it's almost this post-apocalyptic reality. Where Is that people when are Israel like, got Israel? When did Israel get Israel? Israel became Israel in 1947. 46, 47. So that was after World War II, and there was a mass migration of Jews, uh, especially from Russia, Orthodox Jews, and, and across Europe, of course. And they were displaced. Nobody wanted to have them. Um, there's a big problem of what to do with a lot of these people. And um, Ben uh, Ben Gurion, the first prime minister of Israel, he established the state, and they fought very hard to maintain that territory. And after, after a lot of conflict with the uh, Palestinians and stuff, they, they eventually established a state. And the Americans backed them up, not officially. I think the idea was they were covertly supplying them with um, weaponry and, and, and supplies and things like that. But it was probably one of the most incredible struggles of uh, state we'll establishment to, in we'll, recent history. We'll have to do a, a little bit of a study on that as well yeah that's always, a i'm really interested to get deep deep into that and see how far back that if that kind of stuff anybody goes. wants to learn about the establishment of israel in a historical fiction sense read Le leon urus um exodus it's a fantastic novel it's the first book that ever made me weep openly um for probably the first piece of artwork that ever made me uh, weep openly and uh, anyway, no, it's a it's a beautiful book. It's cool. It's historical. It makes you care about the characters. It's a great love story. It's a great action story. When you saw that nude picture of me that Banksy did, I'm pretty sure that you wept. What? <laughs> I think <laughs> you. Sorry, sorry, continue, continue. I, continue. I think you. I'll just always got, have those random. Actually, the only painting that's ever made me weep was uh, by Salvador Dali, and it's not his surrealist that's stuff. Not it's not his weird stuff. It was a painting oh, he did. A, he's got a different spectrum of art that he does other than weird. Well, he he started painting as a child. And uh, I think one of his first paintings, which is on his uh, website, it's uh, it run by, I think, his family or, or, or people like that. Whoever has control over his art now um, runs a website with archive. The first painting is a painting he did when he was like four or five. It's a painting of his house. And uh, it, it's just it's just great, man. I don't know. Good. That was what you wept at? Yeah. His painting of his house? Yeah. 
Oh, I guess a child's like painting. Child's, child's but child's it's memory. not that it was childish. It was just that you could tell that it was not only a real place, but it was from the perspective of that boy looking at that place, thinking about his home, and just that reflection in art. Like, man, nothing's more powerful than that. That was, that was beautiful. I'm going to have to look at it. Admittedly, I was on LSD at the time. I'm not going to say it was because of the acid. I was feeling a heightened emotion. I, th- I feel like I was very objectively. I was looking at the picture. See, I, was, I thought I was going to maybe. I was really taking it, it apart. Well up and a little bit. Now, I, now I no, I was gonna... feeling it, man. I was feeling it. So back to the post-materialism, I wanted to, to just point out that we always. Because you had said the other day when we were talking, we want to take a before a care of ourselves, take care of ourselves before we take care of the planet. Mm. But the interesting thing about that is that we get well beyond that comfort place like i'm technically living a life of luxury just having this studio this podcast equipment anything that i have in here this is like we're living the life of luxury right indoor now. heating but yet we're always like trying to get to the next level i gotta buy a house I gotta do this i gotta do so much for myself and be so luxurious living myself before i mind anything and sometimes it's not just yourself you think you're doing it for all the right reasons because you're doing it for your family well how much luxury does your family have to live in Mm -hmm. before you'll give a shit about the planet or other people outside of your herd and herds come in families or in friend circles or in cities or towns or or many different kind of little cliques but like how Mm. much does it take for you to give a shit about somebody outside of one of your herds so the problem is that environmental impacts have become so damaging and and have reached limits uh, of such extremes that uh, certain people can't afford to take care of themselves until they address environmental issues. And a lot of these environmental issues that... So the people that reap the Are most... caused from us lo- use it, what we do in the 1%? Right. So yes, it, well, essentially that's it. So the people who we're... contribute the least to environmental damage are affected the most and the poorer you are generally the closer your proximity is to nature so the more that you rely directly on nature and your natural environment it's awful right so you'll have a country that like china it's a manufacturing country and they manufacture shit for everybody else in the world right it's big economically they thrive for sure so they're pumping out all this air all this uh sorry co2 in the air right and they're fucking up the atmosphere not just them but they're a big contributor and, um, you know, who gets impacted the most by acid rain or sea level rise? Probably island communities that are underdeveloped or, or lesser developed and contributing much less than the great state of China to these issues. And how are they supposed to solve them with a lower GDP, lower impact, smaller voice? So tell me, how does this type of thing relate to the issues that we have with Canadian first world versus the state that? some aboriginal communities are living in because of the way that we operate right so you know that is essentially racism um and and colonialism so colonial well, mindset is crazy you just kind of took all that and it was just one word boom oh for sure because really it's just like you're just treating people differently because of like what they look like and what they are yeah. right um you know you can Countries can be invaded and taken and leadership Which is so changed weird that we do that. Obviously, and... anybody can say that in general. But, I mean, mm-hmm. look at Stephen Harper's haircut. Mm-hmm. How are we treating him better than we're treating anybody else? Mm-hmm. That's right. Doesn't make any sense. For sure. Or uh, why are you, you know, why do prisoners, this, this is going to sound fucked up and I don't really mean it this way, but just to show some disparity is like, why do prisoners in jail get three meals a day when there are native children starving or you know when there's people in the homeless people in the streets like living in poverty they should have all the people in prison doing work that benefits because trust me when i tell you Mm -hmm. i know people have been to prison Mm -hmm. and you're just chilling a lot of the time for sure because they can't make you work for no money with slavery i think that they should make them do some some work because they or at least give them some good books and not even work but like Mm -hmm. not work like here go pound a rock with this giant hammer no no like, what, what were they even doing back then i don't even know breaking rocks yeah but making railroads they need That's to have a doing. system where people are like okay we have all these problems people in prisons if you give them a structure of something they can contribute to to, to bettering themselves and 
somebody else that's in need, whether it's somebody that's impoverished or somebody that's in whatever situation, a lot of the times they'll do a bang up job. They'll do a great job if you give them. And what else are they going to do with their time in there? Give them some opportunities to use the skills that they either have mm-hmm. and haven't gotten enough opportunities to use mm-hmm. or that they could have if you give them any chance to develop them. So, so that's the thing. Like, if you're talking about prison, it's meant to be a correctional facility. Correction meaning that You're correcting re- anything. If well, you can show, let them be responsible and be leaders and love people. That will correct them. Yeah, I was going to say. So, what does reform really look like, especially to a violent criminal? Let's take let's take the worst of the worst, right? Like you got a murderer in prison. You go to prison for murder, right? Of course. How are you going to become a better man? You, you, from what I've witnessed and heard, it's you just have to be lucky enough to get a few good men around you that really understand and have a, some level of of knowledge and insight and and and, and goodness and, and wisdom and to. Yeah, people say opposites but attract, but that's like, kind of bullshit, right? It's like minds meet like, and um, I think in I a, think both contained environment you really got to be sure of yourself and in your actions have to express your certainties you know and so people just, will that is something that you can take to the bank that's some good information right there hmm. now you can all go to jail and just yeah just be your best self go be your best self brother no worries no no not that part that's not oh, helpful be okay your best self. that's like just live your best life this corny new saying that the kids are saying sure the one thing where you said um what did you say be certain of yourself and make sure all your actions show that. Yeah, that's being Boom. your best self. That's what. No, 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 <laughs> it's not the same thing. No, it's not the same thing. No. One works in prison. The other one sounds right. like the Brady Bunch. Yeah, just be your best life. Be your best self. Be your best self. That's yeah, guidance yeah. counselor no. advice. Let them know you're sure of yourself and make sure they know you're sure of yourself. And all your right. <laughs> now, if your actions are reflecting your confidence and and everything else, like how great would it? But with a balance, because you can't have arrogance. That's what I mean. Nobody likes it. Arrogance strikes everybody. We can agree on this. Arrogance strikes everybody in a bad way. Even if you're not actually being arrogant and you're just speaking in a way, even in a joking tone. But that's the thing. Do you do you mind scaring away people who don't want to confront that? If I see a smart motherfucker and he's like, I'm a smart motherfucker, and he's telling me some smart fucking shit, it's like I want to listen to that guy. I'm not going to be like, whoa, like you're too much for me in this ego. It's like I'm going to reap that. Okay, well, I'll say that yes. I don't care if they're saying that if they have good stuff to back it up. Right. That won't deter me. Mm. It will immediately, it will, I'll start by being like, like, come on. Like, yeah. Don't like, be an asshole. Yeah. But, you know, but then yeah. you back it up with some shit. I'll be like, oh shit, son. Okay. You're the shit. Yeah. That's what I mean. So it's just like, I feel like, you know, but that, that's the thing. So if you're in that position, do you, are you worried that your personality would put somebody off to the point where it's like they don't want to listen to what you have to say and does that bother you because i feel like if somebody's like that and they don't really want to hear what you have to say and stuff it's like well i'd rather just talk to somebody who is Sometimes willing to get I feel on my like level. i really want to be convicted and just take the onus upon myself of strengthening the way with which i'm communicating so that people don't get easily um whatever but sometimes i just like to say silly things and have fun like especially when i'm playing like sports and stuff like mm. I don't know, but like, why can't you have fun with that? And just, it, I'm very obviously joking, but it's not always obvious to everyone. Like, fair enough. But you're not can worried think you're about talking some serious shit, and I'm so not. Like, I'm actually think I'm like terrible at the sport I might be playing at the time, and I'm just talking the shit because, like, just as just to make jokes. Like, I right. I just don't want to see smart people making concessions strictly to just be understood by the masses like you know i don't i don't want my opinions to be just digestible by 100 percent of people right like not all of them. you do want people to get on your level right and you kind of want to you know bring people up out of the the mass but there's people in history that have done it with the most simplistic the highest type of thing that they're trying to convey mm-hmm. in the in in a very much a lowest kind of terms that's true look at jesus i mean he those parables were dope they took really great ideas forget the religious aspect and all that stuff that traumatizes people yeah the shit that he said in the red words in the bible those parables were fucking dope well so i'm saying like if jesus was walking around or whatever and talking to people it's like these people are experiencing knowledge they're not having to sit down and read a book 
like you know it's happening and um fuck i forgot where i was going with that fucking jesus threw me off so <laughs> sorry socrates actually here hold on I'm gonna find <laughs> yeah no we're uh... Right. So, yeah, I was just saying, like, yeah, when he spoke, it was it was taken seriously. Right. And he's just like a Jewish carpenter because it was conveyed in a non judgmental, very humble mm. and a perfect example is when there's the the adulteress and everybody in the city comes around. Do you remember that story? Mm-hmm. Everybody in the city comes around and they're all ready to stone her because they think that she's broken some rule that's this this greater sin than anything they've ever done so that she needs to be in suffrage and be killed and then all he says to them which is authoritative it's all those things but it's nothing that's like offensive all Mm -hmm. he said was let the first of you without sin cast the first stone that's right and then it says that the older ones left first Mm -hmm. knowing because they were old enough to know that they could not Mm -hmm. proclaim to be someone without sin well, more and then the younger ones slowly come into realization until nobody was left. That's right. And then he just said, change it. Don't do it anymore. Like, right. Don't just it, like, learn from it, it. It's a man's nature to judge man, but the only one who can really judge is God. Or In, with the, whatever this math or infinite force is. Like, but you, that's, that's what I'm it, saying. So Sometimes you, I just call it math. Right. It could be math. It's infinite. Like you're saying, it could just be logic. Yeah. Because if fries and gravy... Makes your body bad. It doesn't matter if you believe it's good. That's the science. It's still gonna it make... could be a science of morality. Nobody right. Knows. So that's an objective truth. Doesn't matter what you believe, that truth. And I is... believe there's probably universal objective truths. So yeah. It seems like pretty fairly obvious if you just look at how everything is math. I think there is the objectivity l- in math. Not to get too uh, you know, out there or whatever, but yeah, I think th- I think there is within our three di- three dimensions. Once you get outside of that, the rules change, obviously. But, I, you know, I just thought it was important to point out that, you know, Jesus was not just a man. The idea of Jesus as a character and the reason why he's spoken of and and everything else is because that is the manifestation of God as a man to experience human suffering. So yeah, that's, that's take what it, it as what you will, right? Like, yeah, mean, that's the interesting part, though. So you don't mm-hmm. need to take it of anything religious, anything other, any, believe anything about him existing or him being whatever thing he's supposed to be if you read that parable or any kind of some of the other parables he has it's just good proverbs just like confucius or anything else where it's like there's certain things you can read is like this is obviously awesome to think like this and it would be it would elevate me to to adhere to some of the the, the mindsets yeah as like a literary critic and as a historian uh, in literature it's always really fascinating to re-experience some of these biblical proverbs and texts because once you don't approach it from a theological standpoint and you look at it purely objectively or academically it becomes quickly apparent that a lot of these um, experiences are mental exercises these are examples set in the day to teach you certain you know values and ethics and morals and practices and processes and if you look at it that way it's like i would have loved to have that book had i grown up in you know the middle east 2000 years ago i'd be fucking psyched but it's like today we you know we have a broader range of information and access to uh cap on that no okay (laughs) but we do we have the broader range of of access and uh so we don't just need the bible we can explain things in a million different ways and have it said in a million different languages right well that's what something i want to point out is very important is Mm. that's how we always will approach things here is we're not into this gobbledygook or this new age hipster whatever or this old age religion we look at everything fairly in its context scientifically but not limiting ourselves to just the science that Stephen Hawking has discovered because there's other sciences that exist existed during other times that we do not any longer have. And we're not going to blacklist as though that could exist. We can look at things in a serious way, in a serious scientific way and try to look for uh, whether it's empirical evidence or whatever else. That's right. Yep. And, and on my part, I think, you know, the best I can contribute because I don't have a professional scientific background. I don't have the academic knowledge necessarily to 
contribute to any new revelations, but any any theories necessarily. So what I want to bring to discussions like that is obviously a mode of critical thinking. And I think that's what we want to encourage in our listeners as well, um, is that we're going to say things at certain points of time that, you know, will change the way we think, or we may change the way we think uh, after we have said those things or, or what have you. And so it's important to be a critical listener as much as it is. Yeah. To we love feedback. We want to be able to, the whole goal of our podcast is for everybody that listens to it and us to consolidate all of, all of the different higher views that we have from different mindsets, different ages, different cultures, different whatever, and being able to like power ranger that shit and have a higher view than we did at, uh, at the beginning of the conversation. And, um, one thing I wanted to just quickly mention on on the authoritative kind of because of the the amount of humility and non threateningness of Jesus, people accepted it so much and he had such a following supposedly. Um, Socrates was kind of a different story. So he took on a wife that was apparently unless it was the Aristotle I'm thinking I'm ninety nine percent sure it was Socrates. We had like a super difficult wife who when you read about her being described she sounds like this big loud kind of like boisterous yeah yep. and but he live he loved it for his character hmm. which is really really interesting but he went around and i think probably it would be safe to say he was probably a pretty humble person he spoke okay. a lot on humility but when he would go and challenge people and question people mm -hmm. got to the point where they wanted to just kill him yeah because right. they're like, stop challenging the way we think and making us not have answers to things that we think we believe. Um, you're a blasphemer or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, and this isn't this isn't a figure I can speak uh, to with a lot of um, uh, authority at the moment. But yeah, Socrates was a very interesting guy. And I think he kind of approached the human experience in a very rational way um, where he wasn't afraid to not only speak with confidence and explore things that people maybe weren't willing to explore publicly or openly or outside of the, you know, courts and the, and the higher uh, social systems, but he was bringing a lot of uh, that into his actions. Like you're saying the way he lived his life and everything. I think he tried to be a physical exemplar of what knowledge would look like manifest in to a person right like he, but he's he tried a, to make everywhere his acropolis if you will yeah and i think that's an interesting place to point out what we're trying to do with the podcast is like we want to be a socrates and use this we want to use the socratic method of asking all of the kinds of best questions mm -hmm. without the that uh, get the answer not right. the ones that we want to to drive our agenda or our current opinion right but to challenge our current opinion challenge everybody else's opinion and try to get to a better understanding of a lot of the current big ideas, big topics, and the lazy conversations that I feel I often have to try to learn from. Right. And remember too, like Socrates format of education was the open concept, right? Like it was the marketplace. Like he learned where people were. And for a podcast where it is two people sitting in a studio, um, we've got access to the internet, all this great information. Sure. But we need the community input as well. And we need to get out there obviously and speak with people, have people in here to, to speak with as well, but uh, definitely community feedback. Is, yeah, so we're going to have uh, lots, of, lots of important. different kinds of guests, uh, lots of unexpected and interesting guests, I think, from all around the world. And we always want to hear from people. Everyone can email us at um, higherpodcast at gmail.com. Um, and I think the other thing we want to do along with the Socratic method, though, is exactly what we discussed, you know, in the last few days, which is having an approach that we're not condemning anyone and then we'll just quickly point out there's two different kinds of judging there's judging and using discretion where if you're stuck in the middle of the desert late at night and it's a thunderstorm and lightning and there's miles and miles and miles in each direction that right? you can't walk anywhere anytime soon and somebody there's two people that pull up in two different vehicles one guy's like this he's a big man he's a hairy guy i don't know if that makes sure. me scary right? who knows we'll have a conversation no say you say you're you're a young woman and, and then say there's a car yeah, with a exactly. big man or, or there's, there's one with like an old lady and she's sure. got a kitten in church music perfect playing. that's using judgment in discernment yep. we have to be able to judge each other's opinions in order to have 
can I come up with a question or am I buying into what you're saying? Because I'm not, because all the questions I'm asking, you're answering in a way that makes sense to me. Right. And it's a, it's discretion, right? Because like, say a senior citizen pulls up, she's a crazy cat lady or what have you, what, you know, whatever the, the character archetype is. And then the, the big badass biker guy rolls up. I'm probably going with the big badass guy only because I know how some, you know, seniors tend to drive at the speed limit below the speed limit yeah, at times but at the same i want to get where i'm going but here's what's interesting <laughs> that's still regardless mm-hmm. who you choose you're yep. still using the discretion that i'm talking yes, about discernment Maybe you want yep. to go with the biker guy because it's scary and it looks like there's in the thunderstorm there's like you know, gotta get the fuck out of there you want you want to go houses all around yeah or it's a bad neighborhood you need some protection. i'd rather go with the big guy the that's right gonna get me killed. she's gonna be driving all slow oh sure no protected she's gonna stop gonna at the first the guy car. yeah to stop on the gas mm-hmm. yeah okay oh, good, it's a mess. Point. good point either way discretion and judgment is mm-hmm. not the same as condemnation and ill feelings towards judging Correct. somebody's opinion so Correct. we never judge anybody's opinion tell us all your opinions uh, any just random trolling or foolishness we'll just delete and never pay any attention to. But anybody that has some great uh, things to say or little statements or opinions on it, we'd love to share your view either anonymously or with your name. Yeah, make sure to include your name or uh, or Twitter handle or anything like that that you want. Yeah, or to, just uh, pick a name. We If you want to be called Thor Annihilator 2500, we will call you Thor Annihilator 2500. Right. Cause you know that, that you're being acknowledged and we're attributing to you the credit of that opinion. Uh, and maybe giving some thoughts on your opinion ourselves. Right. So quickly, as we will come a little closer towards the ending here, um, let's talk about the limits. So the limits of just, so we get to those plateaus. Let's come back to the core of the conversation is contentment, human limits. We get plateaus, whether we're doing it with food or sex. I think sex is one of those ones that's like it's really common for like and that's why 50 shades of gray exists because now people feel that they need to have this perfect scenario and anything below that is not freaky enough or is not indulgent enough or is not satisfying enough for them and Mm. we need to start like doing like crazy things like what where do you stop because everybody's looking at me right now oh go ahead do your thing you know whatever floats your boat blah, blah blah but no but no, you will have a limit somewhere. Right. And we can get into the details, but anybody that comes on this show or, or emails in, everybody's got their limits. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but no, you're some, right. But they there's do. some crazy stuff going on out there. Yep. I remember being in a call center, working in a call center, and some dude there who's just like a weird dude in general had this, I think it was maybe from Germany, actually, but it was somewhere okay. in Europe. Okay. Yeah, don't somewhere give me those Europe. eyes. I'm not somewhere taking responsibility for this motherfucker. <laughs> somewhere in Europe, they had this magazine where there was like this thing that you could put this, think of like a potty that you buy for a child, like one of those little potty things, but you yeah. can put that on top of somebody's head and it's for an adult to poop into the other person's oh. face and or mouth. I don't know. You're describing this like I don't have one upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm describing the one that you have upstairs. Yes. No, but like... Oh, man. Like... And I just remember that would like caused so many questions in my brain when he showed me that. And I and I only looked at the cover because I'm very like pr- protective, as I've told you about. Like I don't want any images in my head that I don't want in my head to to like ec- be exercised. Sure. So I don't want any like flashbacks of anything I never wanted to see. You don't want some uh, you know trauma, I mean? no, some no, PTSD. Like, or... That's why I don't even like like watching overly gory stuff in movies and stuff. Like, yeah, I don't have you ever seen? About, I don't want to think about intestines falling on somebody's body when I'm trying to eat spaghetti. Have you ever seen like Sorry. any violence, yes. any extreme violence, or anything like that in real life? Yeah, uh, I wouldn't say extreme violence. You know? Yeah. No. Okay. I wouldn't say extreme violence. Yeah. But uh, I mean, what I mean, it depends on what your perception of extreme violence is. Well, I mean, maybe. Because I'm thinking of like some crazy, like uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre type of shit. Right. That's what I mean, I'm looking for. I'm some, like, who has seen that, though? Well, like, so, really? you know, some people have witnessed car, people, car yeah. accidents, some brutal, you know, there's some broken yeah, cars. Yeah, true. No, I've never seen activity. some crazy shit like that. Thankfully. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, what I guess what, what people who do experience a lot of violence say is that you know, it, you build that tolerance. Like, of course, of course, these are things that traumatize I know. Okay, so you. There's a great example, though, it, is do you want to build a tolerance to that? I do. I, I do in the sense that it's just like everybody's going to experience violence at some point Unlimited? in their life. Okay, that's fair. That's fair what you're saying right now. But then we have to ask a question. Again, I don't have an opinion. We're mm-hmm. going down that road just right now and navigating on the spot. Unlimited violence? No, of course not. Of course not. 
Yeah, there's limits for sure. Because at some point it becomes damaging, right? Yeah, And definitely. then even if you were to say yes to that, mm-hmm. and you said, yes, I want a glimpse into everything so that I can know the, the greatest heights and, 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 and subterrain, or mm-hmm. whatever you want to call it, mm-hmm. of the human condition, yeah. the human nature, the human state. But then even then, you have to have a limit to what you intake. I don't even know oh, that yeah. having any of it's good. But think about the worst kind of thing. The worst kind of thing you can imagine. We won't yep. even say any of what it is. Just whatever's the worst thing any person can imagine listening to this. Would you want to see a freeze frame of that at all, even for a quarter second? And if you did, how much could you handle before it has an impact? Right. And are you willing to look at it knowing that there's an impact that you may not know, a cause and effect that may end up causing that image to go into your head in to- in a in a way or in a time or in a frequency that is something that you would not be keen on. So this brings to mind a lot of like Holocaust memorial stuff. So, you know, when you when you go to visit a concentration camp, obviously it's modern day. It is not not as this it is was. This is why context is so important because when you go give a little thing like that and then you just say like this is why it reminds me of concentration camp. You got to give a lot of like a long I'm uh, yes okay so I'm explaining so so the deal with Holocaust Memorial when you go to a concentration camp is they they show you they try to reflect the conditions in a way that protects the viewer right so they're not recreating it like it's a fucking haunted house right you go there it's very clean everything's you know very well preserved for the sake of the memorial uh, but you know they do they do film or they screen the Allied footage of when they liberated these camps, and it isn't about just sitting there and watching all this f- crazy inc- incredible footage, right? It's awful. Um, it's not about just like sitting there and watching the whole thing. It's just about getting a glimpse of like what a pile of like emaciated corpses looks like. That's like over the roof of the fucking shack. So they give like you an idea, people. but they don't go into the, they don't zoom in on the, Oh no, you, you, shit. they, they screen the whole footage, but it's up. It's your discretion. If you want to see it all or not. And that's the thing. It's just like, I've been exposed to extreme violence personally. And I've been, you know, have had well, family members, things like, I don't know. Jeez, man. Like, well, just let me if finish. We didn't ha- okay. Yeah. Sorry, yeah right. Just like you, like I've, I've, I have no people who have been victims of extreme violence and I have experienced that myself. Um, and, uh, you know, that's not stuff anybody wants to see as well conditioned as you may be. There's some things that you're never prepared for, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't see it because that's a reality. You know what I mean? And, and what's important with Holocaust Memorial is to have this cause and effect approach where it's like, if this is never going to happen again, then don't fucking forget about it. Like, look at what had happened. And be okay, honest okay, with I that wanna, truth. I want to ask you about this then because you get me on a whole different philosophical tip here. Mm. And especially confused me when you said that last statement. Or not confused me, but just has me like asking a lot of questions. So everybody in the world wants to have this, oh, why does bad things happen? Oh, this, why can't we just all get along? World peace. So mm. if there's world peace, do you still want to remember those things? And if you're remembering those things, are you not keeping the potentiality of that alive? What's the conditions of peace? I don't know. But just let's right? assume right. this utopia. Do mm-hmm. you want to keep those alive? Do you want to keep those memories alive? Yeah, because first of all, utopia can never exist. And and no, no, you no, do no, want no, to keep no, those no, things no, no, alive. No, don't, don't be that guy. No. In I'm, this situation, yeah. in this question, okay. it's a utopia. Yeah. Right now, we've reached a state where everybody's getting along. There's no more racism. There's no more wars. Yeah. Do you keep the memories of those things around? For sure. Why? Because you're now putting it back out there. And maybe there's this, pay attention for a second. Maybe, not pay attention, but like follow I got you, second. I got you. There's always going to be this draw to things like, you know, I could, I could go, well, that's why people send notes to serial murderers. It's not because they really understand this person and they see something beautiful in them and they want to explore, which would be great. Mm-hmm. Or bring out the best of them. It's because they have this weird fetish with this thing. Yep, that's right. So, so like fascism. Somebody for would example. become fetishized by this. Oh, I want to make a big body of dead corpses. That would be cool. But so, they never knew about it. And that, this is interesting because it goes back to the kind of conversation of Adam and Eve type of biting into that knowledge of evil. Do we need to have that, or should we not have it? And and not. You know, 
it's a long, complicated conversation. There's so many questions going through my head right now. Right. I don't want to jump. I don't want to get really into the Holocaust today. But what I th- I think is important is that what they're talking about when they put that information out there, and it's it's this doctrine of of don't forget these atrocities to ensure that these atrocities don't occur again is really just like it's not about teaching like nazi ideology no you just gave me you just basically said the answer is as long as you're teaching those items in a way that's really giving an understanding to avoid it as opposed to just letting it sit there and let people interpret in any way that the that the that the human nature may go for sure because like we were saying before like the first world war was considered the great war that everybody thought the world's fucking gonna end and then you know it's not it's like what 25 years later something like that you have another world war like the like that that shit existed in a time and place that is so fucking alien to us today it's really hard to wrap your head around and so it is important to perpetuate that history and to let it be known because it's really easy for you know 9 million people to be forgotten okay so I want to jump on this real quick. This makes sense. We, if there's vital information, we want to pass it on. Mm-hmm. So right. why is Lessons. it that if that simple precept is so easy for us to understand as humans, mm-hmm. and we see so amazing things that people have built in the past, I hate to go down this ancient aliens pyramids Ooh. road for a second, Uh-oh. but like if pyramids exist or all of these amazing things and all of history that we see, they wrote things down to us in different versions, whether some of them seem religious or some of them are just like weird Sumerian texts, whether those yeah, things esoteric are. Or, yeah, esoteric yeah. It's beyond my comprehension how these types of things aren't a great interest to many people because people wrote down some things just to write shit down but that's more mm-hmm. of like a 2018 type of thing like going online <laughs> and just trolling blogging on Instagram. yeah people right. aren't going and trolling on a, a tablet with a chisel right. like because it takes craftsmanship yeah like there's a cra- yeah i didn't even think it about takes that. like skill. the craftsmanship that goes into it like oh, yeah. why are we not interested in reading these antiquity tests that people texts that people passed forward for a reason and that's why i was determined to find out so badly where was the original place that people started leaving us texts behind, which seemingly as far back as I can get to find is the Emerald Tablets, Hermes Trismegistus. I'd love to know if anybody can tell me anything that's supposed to be before that, but yeah, I why mean, don't well, people want to know about these things? We want contentment through some weird random things that any just will just accept from somebody that tells us or some physical thing that we want to buy. And we won't put in the work to figure out where is the good information that exists in the universe and what is actually going to grant me authentic contentment. I think it's, um, I think we're society can become a victim of amnesia in a certain way you know certain events happen certain world orders change information is controlled distributed differently new new world order well yeah but you talk like look at the the rise of christianity right how was that information that had been passed on for hundreds or or more thousands of years before christianity distributed and taught and talked about and then christianity takes a lot of these precepts repackages it puts it into a different structure and format and creates this new educational system based on you know how how they've interpreted that information okay but here's some in, something interesting i i have conceived as possible by listening to some of these antiquity texts recently is these enlightened beings like this Hermes Trismegistus or whoever else was before him or, I mean after him and potentially somebody like a Jesus were these enlightened beings that were able to excuse me reincarnate without experiencing death so mm-hmm. it says in the emerald tablets that's right yeah for sure he says not by death but by willing it and mm-hmm. I don't know I forget what the rest of the explanation was but they were able to then pass into a new life and and take over that same role of enlightenment passing on in the new life so it seems like it could have been what you said or a million other things repackaging yep. or a million other versions or it could have also been 
and I'm not leaning towards this, just one of the many, but an interesting one to think about is that same type of being or energy coming in a new form to give the new era that same kind of message. Here's an interesting question for you. So what's a modern day death ritual? How do people how do people symbolically kill themselves in order to gain new knowledge? So if you were if you were a modern day contemporary scientist, you want to lift that veil of ISIS. You want to like f- see that real untapped like power of nature. How how would you a- a- ascend above your your current state? I feel like ayahuasca is how people are doing that, right? Like, I don't. Do you need something like that? I think I think people do. I think people do because they don't know how to maybe, do that themselves. I would I would I would say maybe because of how much we've been brainwashed and kind of dis like in, incapacitated from using our full extent of our faculties that might be something that would be necessary to kind of try to remove every, everything from like all the bullshit from in front of you. Mm-hmm. I would totally do it. For sure, I, like Once. so. There's... Now, it sounds pretty intense, and I yeah. didn't enjoy drugs when I experimented with a couple in high school because they just seemed like it was just a lot. It, yeah, you just, I don't like not having like I feel like the control, and plus like something like acid or things like this. Mm-hmm. Like these last for several hours. This is not a that does no. You're gonna like sit there and wait it out. No, right. So okay, so like the in ancient Egypt. They don't know this 100%, but because of the um, the um, sonic resonance within the Great Pyramid of Giza, in the king's chamber, uh, it's it's an echo chamber, and that's the way it's built with several tiers of ceiling. Um, I did not know what the echo thing. Didn't they mummify their dogs and shit? Cats. Yeah. Whatever. Oh, cats, really? Okay, Man, fuck you. you. Fuck Dude, cats. you got to get on board with cats. I'm going to make you into cats a cat Cats don't person. care about you. Their pee smells Nor should like they. Satan. Dude, you think cats Satan smell bad? Fucking dogs. Cats yeah. clean themselves, at least. Dogs. Dogs clean themselves constantly, just the same way, licking They're themselves. They're nasty. Nah, man. Dogs are dirty. They eat their own shit. They're, don't make me get all Pulp Fiction on this. <laughs> no. It's okay. I don't know. I don't want to believe they eat their own shit, but I remember as a child seeing a dog dig up frozen shit and eat it. Dogs and me and my brothers shit? laughed so hard that my little brother ended up puking, and wow. he still was laughing so hard. You know why dogs do that, too, is to show subservience. That's not a good reason to do that. No, dogs are fucked. And they got fucked up psychology, and they're really weird and emotional, and I'm not into it. It's a lot of okay, fucking no, work. Okay, dude. this is a different this is a different podcast, but we're definitely coming <laughs> right? back to this. Yeah, and I'm very interested to know. Good cats versus dogs. A lot of people hating you on you right now. I know. I, a lot I'm of people hate on me because I hate cats. So fuck cats. I'm, I'm and he polarized. says fuck dogs. Yes. And we want to know your opinion about cats, and dogs. Yes, please. Send us we your can opinions. all agree that cat pee is Satan farts, though, right? It's not the best. It's I feel not like not the best is what you're going with on that. If I'm gonna get it's pissed not on, the best and... is what you're going with. If I'm going to get pissed on by an animal, a cat is... It's the last I, one on earth. As opposed to an elephant? I do, I do not want to get pissed yeah, on by an elephant. Because an elephant pee will just rinse off and it won't be stinky. <laughs> okay. To be continued, my friend. To be to continued. Be continued. Indeed. <laughs> All right. Here at Higher Podcast, we pay for our SoCan license. So we can play any music we want in the world. We're not going to be playing much of anything from North America anytime soon. Uh, big track coming up with Tenny the Entertainer. I highly recommend everybody follow her on Instagram. Anytime she sings, no music, just straight, perfect melodies, perfect voice all the time. Uh, Big Up Nigeria. Going to play a big song from her here called Fake Jersey, which I guess has to do with something. I don't know. I guess there's a lot of fake jerseys being sold in the streets of Nigeria. So if you need a good fake jersey, hop over to Nigeria. If you need big tune, Tenny the Entertainer. Wow, wow. One more of it, Jazzy. No more hey, Jimmy. Think I've been no my one fake Gucci. Go there, call anybody. One more of it, Jazzy. No more hey, Jimmy. Think I've been no my one fake Gucci. Go there, call anybody. Ooh, yeah. I go to Nike website. 
They say the jersey don't sell out, yeah. I call them make up for the yapa. They make her tell me, say the jersey not too far. I say, hey, make her give me one five. They make her say, no, madam, I go give you for two K. I say, hey, make her, oh, no, no, no. One more more fake jersey. No more hey, Jimmy. Tima be no more fake Gucci. Could I go anybody? podcast we're going to be talking about an extension of this conversation which is just talking about being more mindful of time being more mi- mindful of micro decisions and not the micro decisions that are whispers in your ear that are just the foolishness that we grew up around we need to reach out into all the new places around us people friends make new friends don't just get stuck in the circumstances and the lot- lottery that you're born into with the f- and the people that you go to high school with and the and the family that you're born into, go out and have as many conversations as possible, start to extract the good information and apply it in ways that are actually going to make you content. And the next conversation is going to be about just getting into a little bit more of the limits of how much we indulge, um, the opposite side of the human aspect, which is when we're depraved of a lot of these good, basic, simple things. We can have everything in the world physically in materialism and have none of the most basic needs. You can have the shelter. Sure, you got a huge shelter, but you don't have some of the other crucial aspects that make a shelter have any meaning to begin with. Mm. So we're going to talk about those types of things. We're going to talk about valuing time and each micro decision as being much more important than we currently take them. And sometimes I very much want to point out that we're making macro decisions that we think are micro. Mm Mm-hmm. We think that this is just a small decision that we're making, but that decision is actually having a huge impact on our life, Mm -hmm. whether it's having the extra drink or um, a million different things. We'll get into that another time, but uh, we'll shut it down for now. We thank everybody for listening that did and go ahead again and email us any thoughts um, on Facebook. Um, You can message us there uh, through direct message or hirepodcast at gmail.com. And uh, looking forward to another episode soon and some interesting guests. Yeah, thanks, guys.
I bust against the dead. The gentleman alive. Say, be a mess of I do some things I don't remember. My boys be ready for whatever. Make them know they should be forever. They should be forever. Say, be a mess of wood. Only get love for my brothers. My boys be ready for whatever. Make them know they should be forever. They should be forever. Uh. Say, man, them no new friends. They want niggas around me. Them lay my back every day. They feed me when I'm hungry. I know we sell them, I know we. Them no like we bag with Yogi. People praise them, say we bad, but we know the way them cut and load it. So make we live our life. The same shit till we die. Tell them make I do my thing, no room as I die. Say, we are mess and move. I do some things I don't remember. My boys make ready for whatever. Make them know they should be forever. They should be forever. Say, be a mess and woo. Only get love for my brothers. My boys make ready for whatever. Make them know they should be forever. They should be forever. Okay, uh. Damn, nah, many boys say trap it, uh. All day long, yeah, pop it, uh. Tell it look sharp, oh, slack it, yeah, cash it, oh, crash it, on some girl. Then the any have race and then people they criticize we forget them. We they see haters like every radio station. You know what I mean? FM, uh. We be the one money chop. That be the life. We know we stop. Always be ready for whatever. We know they fear nobody. We the fear only one. So we they do things to every day like do. Uh. Rich and brown, we gon' lie you. Won't care who said we you go to cry. We not go mind you. We say baby, I'm a I do some things I don't remember. My boys get ready for whatever. They can do this shit forever. This shit be forever. They can make it so. Only get love for my brothers. My boys get ready for whatever. They can do this shit forever. This shit be forever. See my mouth no go talk. If my eyes never see, then they won't give me trouble. Nothing for here be for free. We they want we we want we are someone can't share anymore. Then they won't give me trouble. But they are just me long TV be a mess and work.